Hey, you can hear me, cool. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about nearest neighbors and vector models. Um, some of it is actually strictly not machine learning, but it turns out to be pretty useful uh, because vector models are getting more and more popular. So I'm the author of a library called Annoy that maybe some of you may have heard of, uh, but I'm gonna talk in general also about like what is it useful for and, and why is it good and how to do it. So this is a little bit about me. I've open sourced a couple of things. I was at Spotify for many years. Uh, I used to run their machine learning team and built a bunch of uh, music recommendation stuff. Now I uh, work at Better, which is startup in the mortgage space. Cool, so, so what's nearest neighbor? So, so let's say you have a bunch of points in some space, potentially high dimensional, and it's really what it sounds like, right? Like you wanna find the nearest neighbors, right? So in this case, we have a query point, and you wanna find, this is two dimensions, right? Two dimensions make sense, because it's easier to project on a, on a uh, screen. Um, and so, in this case, it's really what it sounds like, very simple, like you're trying to find the uh, nearest neighbors. And it turns out this gets tricky as the number of dimensions increase. So it's 20 nearest neighbors, 100 nearest neighbors. Yeah, so, so what's the point? So, so let's, uh, before we start uh, talking about how Annoy works, uh, let's talk a little bit about vector models, because I think there, it, there's a lot of cool stuff about vector models, um, a lot of different, um, uh, domain. So here's a little example, right? So 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 MNIST is sort of the like classic machine learning data set. Um, it's used to, like to, to demonstrate almost everything. So uh, but anyway, so the whole point is there's a bunch of digits. It's uh, it's usually like the you know a great toy data set to play out, play around with things. And and let's so let's start like let's actually naively just define distance as pixel distance, right? So we define distance in this case as a uh, as a Euclidean distance of the pixel intensities, right? And so in this two A to four dimensional data sets, right? And now you can actually use this to find neighbors, right? In this like very high dimensional space. And it turns out that it works kind of well, like you see a couple of failures, like the seven, there's like a three matching, there's a five matching eight, and, but it sort of kind of works. So in theory you could build a, um, a K nearest neighbor classifier if you wanted to, you know, OCR on digits or something like that. Probably not the best algorithm, um, but, you know, it's a good start. But so this is sort of conceptually what you can do in, in higher dimensional spaces. Um, in general, what I always do is when you have a very high dimensional space, in this case 784, I would usually train some sort of dimensionality reduction algorithm. And what I do is I try to project it into latent space, like pick something like 40 dimensions. At Spotify, we always use 40 dimensions, so we try to embed like artists and music in 40 dimensions. And then you can do it in like a little bit smaller dimensional space but you still kind of high dimensional space. So, uh, so here's another example. Here's, here's something I played around with two, three years ago because I wanted to learn about convolutional neural networks. Uh, I scraped uh, six million pictures of food and I try to train it to classify food. This is like sort of end goal is like calorie prediction but I never finished that. Um, but anyway, so, so one of the cool things is that actually the, the, the last, the penultimate layer, this bottleneck layer, right? And so, the cool thing about this convolutional neural network here is we take this like extremely high dimensional picture. Uh, this picture is 256 times 256 times three dimensions, three because of RGB. And we're gonna embed it into 128 dimensions, right? Because you have this like bottleneck layer, so it's kind of cool. Uh, and and the, the last layer, we're actually predicting categories, like what kind of food is in the picture, but that, that's irrelevant to this. So we're kind of forcing an unsupervised representation of this. Um, and now we have a function, which is this neural network, that projects a burger into 128 dimensional space. And the cool thing is now we can use actually Euclidean distance, or it turns out marginally better is if you normalize the vectors, uh, which is called cosine distance. It turns out it works a little bit better. I don't think anyone really knows why, uh, but that's just what it is. So, so now we have, um, in this space of food pictures, we can actually find similar food pictures. And, and it works pretty well, right? Like you see, like the pixels are kind of, like if you actually do like naively, just like looked at the pixels, they're kind of different. Especially the last row, like last row tends to capture pretty well as like desserts, there's like some chocolate like sprinkled over, over it. Um, and it actually seems to sort of conceptually uh, work pretty well. Cool, so I think there's, 
little bit of a misconception sometimes. So I talk to people and it's like this idea that like vector models are new. There's like word to vec started everything. But I've, I've worked with vector models a very long time. Uh, that's what I did for many years. And it goes back pretty far. Um, ben, previous, uh, the previous speaker talked about TF-IDF, uh, which is like kind of naive like text. Uh, way to take like documents and words and project them into space. There's no latent space though, but people have been doing this for a long time. Um, I think it started getting popular with word to vec uh, which is great, uh, but, but it's, it's actually an old idea. So what else? Yeah, so, so the idea is like essentially, you, you've probably seen this um, conceptual idea, but we have, we're trying to take like words and documents and project them into some sort of latent space, uh, like you know, in this case, two dimensions, and we're projecting apple and banana both, and I guess apples and bananas are fruits, so they're gonna be a little bit closer to each other in this space, right? And so that's the way I think about this latent space is uh, concepts and words that are similar are gonna end up really close to each other, and words that are very different are gonna end up far from each other, right? So you get this like map, but, but the dimensions are latent, right? Like, it's two dimensional in this case, but we don't know what the dimensions represent. It kind of discovers that um, without us telling us, uh, telling it what to do. Yeah, so, uh, so vector models for collaborative filtering. I did this a lot at Spotify. We, we, we spent a lot of time on um, taking listening data and, and basically out of that um, building vectors for artists and, and albums and tracks. And it works really well. Uh, and it's an idea that came out of the Netflix price model uh, it turns out actually NLP models work really well for this. In, in the Spotify case, you, you sort of treat um, a, a playlist as a, as a list of words, and the words sort of tracks, and works pretty well actually. Uh, here's an example of, of, of something I built a long time ago. It was essentially projecting artists into two dimensions. Like we initialize them with zero with, with random vectors, and then we run a iterative. Uh, stochastic gradient descent, or whatever, and eventually they kind of converge, and uh, you see this sort of like some metal artist top left, and some some um, some uh, rap in the middle, and some boy bands, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and um, this is only two dimensions, so it's a little bit hard for like to actually build a good map. Like you kind of need like more dimensions generally. Like four, we used 40 at Spotify, it seemed to work, or sometimes a little bit higher. Uh, but uh, yeah, so in two dimensions, the algorithms struggle a little bit. But you can see it sort of like separates things pretty well, right? They like wrap like closer together. And, you know, you can see the cosine of Tupac with himself is one, which is the definition of cosine. And you know, with with Biggie, it's it's pretty high too. Uh, so so this is sort of like conceptually how I think about these vector models. Okay, uh, we can also use it for geospatial stuff. I, I played around with this a little bit. Uh, this is a kind of toy example, but you know, if you have points on a globe, you, just, you get this three-dimensional space, which is actually not latent, right? It's like a real space, right, in this case. Um, I think there's a lot more research on how to do this in two dimensions and three dimensions because it kind of is a geometric interpretation. Uh, but you can use Anoi for that too. But generally, Anoi is like meant to be used in higher dimensional spaces. Um, yeah, there's, um, there's also a little bit of research on taking high dimensional data and projecting it to two dimensions as a way to visualize. Um, and so uh, there's a couple of new algorithms that came up pretty recently. One of them actually uses it in a way. Um, so it might be interesting to look at. Cool. So enough about vector models. Uh, how, how does it work? Like how do, how do you, so, so there's a lot of, so, so again, there's a lot of examples where like the, you get these vectors, right? And then you have this high dimensional space and you wanna find nearest neighbors. And how do you do that, right? And so, naively, we can obviously like brute force search, right? Like, right, like so linearly scan the data set. We have a query point. We scan over all the points, and um, we find the ones that are closest, right? Uh, which is kind of slow, right? So, so Word to Vec actually comes with a tool to do this. Um, we we put in Chinese river. It outputs a bunch of Chinese rivers, uh, and it takes two minutes and 34 seconds, right, from my laptop. Um, cool, so let's talk a bit about Annoy. Um, should have updated this, it actually is even more source, but yeah, so you can check it out, it's pretty cool. Um, 
one cool feature about Annoy is that it uses MMAP, uh, which is, I don't know how many like people know about this system um, uh, command, or not command, uh, this is a standard library function in uh, Linux and Unix. And it's really cool. It takes a it takes a file on disk and it maps it into RAM, and you can do this. Uh, you can actually access this as if it is RAM. And then the other cool thing is the page cache in Linux will eventually start caching this file in RAM, so it's going to be extremely fast. So, so I'm not going to talk more about this, but but the, but the big benefit is is once you build an annoy index, you can map it into memory, and you can do these queries very quickly, and you can actually build up an index, save it to disk. And then load it very quickly later, right? So you don't have to build up the index every time. And Annoy is the only uh, library that supports this because we needed this at Spotify. So, so okay, cool. So let's do this using Annoy. So we stick in Chinese River, and it runs in 470 milliseconds, right? So very quickly because we have a data structure now that lets us do these queries very quickly. Um, Probably no one noticed, but there's actually, the results are actually slightly different from the exhaustive search. Uh, and, and that's what the A in Annoy stands for, approximate. Turns out in high dimensional spaces, uh, it's probably MP complete. No one actually knows. Uh, but it's probably very hard to do actually finding exact nearest neighbors. Uh, so Annoy cheats a little bit and approximates it. So sometimes you're going to miss out on a few rivers. Uh, but you can actually increase a few things. Um, in runtime, and it's gonna. This is actually the exact same results, right? As an exhaustive search, and it's still only two seconds compared to two minutes, so it's very fast, right? Uh, so you can control. There's a couple of ways to control, like how um, how much precision do you want to have versus uh, performance. Cool. So so let's talk a bit about because I think this fun. There's a lot of graphics here. Uh, let's talk a bit about how to build this. Like how does Annoy work? I want to give you a little bit of intuition of like how do you, like one way to, to support this high dimensional uh, data structures. Uh, this is not the only one. There's a bunch of other libraries that do it very different ways, like using hashing and stuff. But this is how Annoy does it. So, uh, and it's actually pretty easy, but it turns out to be a little messy to implement. So you start with a data set, a uh, bunch of points, in this case in two dimensions. You're going to split it kind of randomly. Uh, and then recursively, you're going to split those halves in other two halves, in, in two, two other halves, right? And we're going to keep splitting it, et cetera. Building up a binary tree, right? So building up a binary tree, blah, blah, blah. Until we get to this, uh, to a point where in each leaf, there's only a few nodes. And then we're done. Right? So now, we've, now we've built a binary tree of a point set. And this, this works really well in high dimensional space. You can do this pretty quickly. It's a little bit of heuristics how you actually build it up, but it seems to work pretty well. Cool. And, and then, yeah, so, so you, you, instead of building up a binary, like a full binary tree, you actually uh, keep about 100 elements in each leaf. Leaf is the end nodes of the binary tree. Binary tree. It always confused me why trees in computer science are upside down. Um, but this is the tree um, that it builds up. Cool. Uh, so searching. So let's say we have a query point in this tree. Uh, we built up this binary tree, and now we want to find the nearest neighbors. And so we start with this query point, this white X here, and we're going to search the tree. And, and so it's actually because we built this tree, and, and this tree represents um, uh, basically like hyperplanes in hyperspace, but in two dimensions, it's essentially just lines in the plane that splits the space. On every interior node, we know should we go to the left or to the right. It's basically a matter of like, where do we fall on the side of each line, right? So then we can search it, right? So we end up in this leaf node. Cool. So there's a problem. I don't know if you see it, but you could probably guess what it is. In this leaf node, there's a bunch of points here, but there's also a couple of points outside the leaf node that are closer, right? And so it turns out sometimes you actually need to go to the other side of these random splits. Uh, and so, so as an as, as a extension of the search problem, we're actually occasionally, if it's kind of close to the split, we're going to go on both sides. And it turns out you can actually implement this using uh, a heap, uh, a data structure heap. Um, 
uh, or priority queue, sometimes it's also called. And so, 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 so we're, we're basically gonna do that. We're gonna search an entire binary tree using a uh, priority queue. And now we also look at the other side and it works really well. So it's great. So we use this, yeah, cool. Um, and there's another little trick you can do, which is you can also build lots of trees at the same time. Um, and the reason why this works pretty well is that if you build up one tree, then some points are gonna be like unlucky and end up very close to some random splits. But if you build many trees, then uh, the points are sometimes gonna be close to splits, sometimes gonna be far from splits. And you can actually use this priority queue really well and just search a lot of trees at the same time. Graphically, it kinda looks like this. Uh, we're gonna have to go through, but essentially, this, this is like we built up three trees, and each 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 tree again is is a way to take this high dimensional space and split it up randomly, recursively into a binary tree. So we, so we get three binary trees, and then we search them at the same time. Again, I just wanted to stress that this is all two dimensional. Again, like the whole point of annoy is to go to like high dimensions. Uh, so in general, you wouldn't have two dimensions. It just turns out there's no thousand dimensional projector that could borrow from this previous presentation. Um, cool, so this, this works. Very good, yeah. And so, yeah, we can skip this actually. So we find a bunch of candidates. Yeah, so there's another trick is, you, you sort of use this binary tree to, uh, or this forest as it is, it's called when you have multiple trees, to find a bunch of candidate points and then you take the union and then you're gonna re-rank them by their actual distances and then Set of points in uh, that, that are close. Cool. So another thing I wanted to talk a bit about is cursive dimensionality. I think uh, Alexander from SIGOP talked a little bit about this. This is a cool thing that happens when you have a lot of dimensions. Sort of like in intuition kind of breaks down in, in 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 many dimensions. And one way I kind of think about this is like on uh, like let's let's take like a world map right and a world map you have like cities and like New York is like close to like Philadelphia but it's really far from like I don't know Sydney right turns out in like in a, if, if we live on like a hundred dimensional globe or like a thousand dimensional globe all the distances kind of turn into the same almost so suddenly like doesn't matter where you live you're like almost equally close to any other city. So like, you'd be like equally, almost equally far from Philadelphia as you would be from Sydney in this 100 dimensional, 1000 dimensional world. Uh, so it's kind of messed up. And uh, yeah, so, so, so what, what happens is if you look at sort of the, the distance to the nearest neighbor and the distance to the furthest neighbor uh, in, in, or the furthest point in the space, furthest neighbors, I guess, should be, it's kind of weird. I should say furthest point. Uh, the, the ratio kind of compresses, right? Like, kind of get like, you know, in, in two dimensions, like some points are very far and some points are very close. And same thing in three dimensions. But when you go to like a thousand dimensions, like it's kind of, they're all kind of compressed and like within the same vicinity and it's kind of messed up. So that, this is one of the reasons it's really hard in general and it's kind of an unsolved problem how to do um, high dimensional nearest neighbors, although practically, in general, it works. And um, I don't remember what this is for, but it looks cool. It's a Voronoi diagram. Does anyone know about Voronoi diagram? It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, so this ratio uh, is, is goes to zero. It's kind of measures the sort of compactness of this neighborhood, uh, but so, so, so here's a cool thing that I noticed about a lot of these uh, data sets is um, so in, in reality, even if you have like a really high dimensional projection or embedding of, of points, turns out they actually kind of behave as if they're kind of smaller dimensions. And so I think the word for that is sort of like, it's like a manifold or like there's a lower dimensional manifold in a higher dimensional space. I'm not good at terminology. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of cool. So, it's a, so I, I think this is one of the reasons. So, so this is all kinds of vectors, right? There's a few digits here, there's a 
some, some food vectors, there's a bunch of NLP projections uh, that are just downloaded from the internet. Uh, and and this, they're all like between 100 and 1,000 dimensions, but they kind of act as if they're only like 10 dimensions, right? So it turns out you have this like 1,000 dimensional embedding, but in reality, like almost all the words or whatever it is, they kind of lie in this like 10 or 20 dimensional embedding and they're kind of close to it. And so it turns out, I think this is actually the, the reason why these, these nearest neighbor models work so well in practice. Um, cool, so yeah, so a couple of trade-offs with the algorithm, you can build more trees, um, but then it gets slower, but it gets more accurate, so it's a little bit of a trade-off, like in general, like that's, that's what life is about, right? Like you want, you want fast nearest neighbors, then they're not gonna be very uh, accurate, or if you want high accuracy, it's gonna be slower. And so, so the interesting thing is like, an oil has been a lot about just like thinking about um, L2, L2 memory access latency and things like that and how processors work if you wanna make this fast. Um, cool, so yeah, so another thing I started working on, this is actually a little bit outdated uh, I've been playing around a little bit, like benchmarking various libraries. Turns out Annoy is like reasonably fast. It's not the fastest one. There's a, there's a bunch of other ones that are much faster, uh, about 10x. Um, interestingly, actually, Facebook just released their own GPU accelerated um, uh, one called LOPQ, I think, or something. And also, same week, uh, Flickr also released another one. Maybe it was Flickr that was called LOPQ. I don't remember. Anyway, so, so I think, you know, when I started working on this a couple years ago at Spotify, we, we needed it and I had to build it from scratch because there was not really that much going on, but it seems like more and more people are starting to run into these problems, so it's kind of fun to see more, uh, more competition. There's this uh, guy in, in Carnegie Mellon who's released the, the fastest one, SW Graph, uh, which turns out to be really fast. But you can check this out, there's more stuff there. Cool, uh, what's this, I remember. Yeah, this is the newest one. Nice, awesome. Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things going on here. Locality sensitive hashing is coming back. I don't know if anyone's heard about that, but it's a cool thing you can do. Um, but yeah, I'm running out of time, so perfect. This is the last slide. Please check out these things. Um, check me out on Twitter. I sometimes blog random things. And uh, you should try annoy if you have problems with high dimensional vector spaces. Thank you.